I'm um, Sharon Milligan, and I'd like to welcome you to uh, the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel School of Life Social Sciences here at Case Western Reserve University. Um, I am the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at the School of Social Work and the School of Nonprofit Management, and it's a real joy to have everyone here and, um, you know, and related to IPM because I feel very close to IPM. The Mandel uh, School in general is very proud to be a partner with you, um, the delegates as well as members of the IPM board. Uh, this General Assembly, from our perspective, is a wonderful way to broaden the dialogue and strengthen the work that we do together to improve the lives of women and children all over the world. The Mandel School, like uh, IPM, wants to also connect Cleveland to the world. And while IPM is 40 years old, the Mandel School's relationship with IPM started roughly 12 years ago. The school's relationship is rich, rich and deep. We are one of the first schools, I think, to participate in the IPM immersion trips, which started about 2003. Members of our faculty have sat or currently sit on the Board of Trustees and or the Northeast Ohio Advisor Group that's now called the Passport Society. <laughs> um, I joined the board in 2002. Um, and served for a few years as the chair of the board after we lost our initial, um, well actually the chair, who, a person who became chair when we moved here um, to Cleveland. And our professional graduate students uh, in social work and nonprofit management have completed their field internships and practicums at IPM. So IPM has been very important in the life of, of Mandel School. And I think your first program person who was employed at IPM um, was one of our students, one of our alumni. Right. right. And uh, also Adrian Hess. Adrian? Andrea. Is one of your current students in the MSSA program. So we're elated to have you here, um, here tonight, and we're honored to hear um, from all of you delegates and to honor uh, the work of so many people have made, who have made this organization one that we're all proud of. As I stand here, I can't help for, I can't help but think about those who started my IPM journey, those who are no longer with us. Jan Bullard, who was the, um, the chair at the point that we moved to Cleveland, Richard Searing, and Ralph Brody. And there are others, but when I think about the journey and uh, the decision to be here in, in, in Cleveland, Ohio, they are the people that I, I often think about. Well, enough of this nostalgia. <laughs> now on with tonight's agenda. So now I want to turn the podium over to Jim um, Kemper, who was there, your IPM board president. Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. And it sounds like, sounds like a big deal. I still pinch myself, uh, chair-elect. Um, but when I lo look around the room uh, today and this evening and the rest of this week and uh, look at the other, all the other, the collection of talents and experiences in it, I wonder, what am I doing here? Uh, you know, I wonder why, how I'm so privileged to be in, in this company. Uh, and the person I'm introducing tonight uh, certainly is at, at the peak of that. Someone I do not know well, but want to know well, want to hear what he has to say tonight and uh, beyond tonight. I hope to, uh, to learn much more from him. I studied economics once upon a time, um, even thought I might end up in academia w once upon a time. But when I studied economics, it was, economics was, uh, from most of the economics I studied, it was about scarcity and allocating scarce resources, what, they t uh, what I remember being drilled into me, and certainly it was about profit and maximizing profit. Uh, Jay Friedlander uh, has a little different take on things, or if not a completely different take on things, certainly has added a lot to that. Uh, Jay is the Sharp McNally Chair of Green and Socially Responsible Business at the College of the Atlantic, another place I'd like to learn more about. 
uh, sounds very interesting uh, to me. Uh, he, in addition to working with a uh, sustainable business program there, has created something that I have a feeling we'll uh, hear more about, something called the Abundance Cycle, which sound, I remember somebody else talking, I can't remember what, in, in the context of IPM, talked about IPM as this web of relationships. And I, I thought about web, and then I'm paging through the uh, cycle of abundance stuff, and that looked like a web, too. So I think there's some overlap there. Uh, but the abundance cycle, um, creating abundance, the whole idea of abundance is a, is a nice counterpart to scarcity. And I, I'm just uh, very glad that that that's the angle we're talking about, and uh, Jay's going to help us learn how we can nurture that, create more of it. Uh, the sustainable business angle we, we talk about with our projects, how to make them sustainable, the idea of sustainability. Uh, it's just wonderful to see all these overlaps between the nonprofit world, the business world, the uh, initiatives we have going in, in trying to develop program related uh, investments. Uh, it's, we're not in these neat little niches anymore. Um, and I'm glad it's not just all about uh, grabbing the scarce resources, but trying to create abundance. And with that, uh, I would like to bring Jay Friedlander up here. And a uh, very warm welcome. And we're anxious to hear what you have to say. Thank you very much. The, uh, the framing that you put on this, the scarcity versus abundance, I mean, it's sort of the difference between an economist and an entrepreneur. I mean, it was, so, and I, this is an, I team teach with an economist, um, and we have a lot of arguments about scarcity uh, versus abundance. And thank you so much for the, the introduction, and thank you for having me here, and thank you so much for hosting this at, at Case Western. It's, it's great to be here, and thank you, Joe, for um, bringing me out. Um, so, yeah, a couple, so some of you who I've talked to, I've just mentioned, I've been on, on this whirlwind schedule uh, this last, well, last couple of months, but particularly uh, last week I, I returned from Denmark. And I was studying out there, I, I was leading a program out there with a group of students, and we were studying on a carbon negative island uh, called SAMSO. This island produces more renewable energy uh, than it consumes, and it exports the rest to the mainland. Um, and they use a combination of wind, solar, biomass, and conservation. And they did this roughly 10 years ago. Um, and so, and, and I was, as we were going back and we were on the ferry and I was standing out there and we're on this enormous car ferry um, heading back to the mainland. And I was standing out there with one of the students that we had. We had about 15 students with us from College of the Atlantic and also uh, we had people with us who live on the outer islands of Maine. So islands that are, that are not connected by a bridge or a causeway or anything like that, who are all struggling because their cost of energy is so high. And so I asked this student, you know, how, how was it? Like, was it worth it to spend three weeks of your life on this island? What did you learn? And he's, he looked over at me and, and he kind of paused for a minute. And he said, you know, before this trip, I thought, the problem was about technology. I thought we needed to invent the newest, best technology, and that's what I was going to do. They said, after being there, what I realized is when you talk about climate change and global warming, it's a social problem. If I can paraphrase what he's saying, it's a problem of perspective, right? And what do you see out there? And once you change your perspective and you're able to see new things, suddenly the, the possibilities really can know no bounds. And so that's, that's what I want to talk to you about tonight in, in this whole idea of creating abundance. So for those of you who aren't familiar with this, has any, does anyone here know about the business model canvas? Has anyone seen it? So if you were a business student here and you had just gotten your MBA or you were in a startup company, this is all the rage. It allows you to chart out the entire business on one sheet of paper. Right, and here you can talk about your customers, your relationships, the channels, what is your value proposition, as well as how you fulfill that with these activities over here, and your costs and your revenues. Right, it, it is designed to implement. Right, go fast, make things happen, and, and it's being used in startups all over the world right now. 
Now, the problem with this is it doesn't really stop and ask you, you know, where are you going? Um, and what are you doing? What is the direction that you're headed in? And now, just to kind of illustrate this point, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a little movie here with Biscuit, uh, the sleepwalking dog, um, who will demonstrate what happens when you do not understand the direction that you're heading in. And there are certainly consequences. No. <laughs> Poor biscuit, right? I mean, it's terrible. But that, that's what happens when you do not think about the direction you're heading in before you run off and go somewhere. Now, while the consequence, I mean, biscuit is fine. He's OK. Live to make another video. Um, but the consequences that have been happening all over the world are you know, not nearly so, so humorous. Um, and so what you have, and, and really, in, in many ways, I think that business which I'm talking about using in a way to create abundance, is presently our current you know, method of destruction. Um, and so you have consequences. And you can turn a completely verdant landscape you know, into something like this. And this is a, a picture of the tar sands um, up in Canada. And to give you an idea of the kind of scale that we're talking about here, you know, this is an enormous mining truck, you know, the kind with the wheels that are taller, that are much taller than a person. Um, there is a backhoe in here somewhere, I think it's right down here, um, just to give you a sense of the size and scale of the destruction that this is happening. Uh, and this is happening you know, in many different ways. Uh, things like this are happening all over the world. But I know we're here, we're, you, know, you all are with IPM, and um, there's students here as well. And so you're saying, like, well, you know, I would never do that. And so the question that I have for you, though, with, is, um, are you maximizing your impact? Are you really looking at ways you can redefine pathways and make things happen on, an, on a bigger scale and mend some of this damage that has been happening out there in the world? And so just to give you an example, you, know, you could talk about alternative transportation and promoting um, people on bicycles, and you could come up with this, right? I mean, this is basically you know, something designed to kill a bicyclist. Um, <laughs> And you know, riding through the streets of New York City here, dodging taxi cabs. And you really, to do this, you have to be either under the age of 25 or you know, have a, a somewhat of a death wish. Um, so you can do something like this. But, but if you look at this in a different way, you can create something like this. Now, this is a bike highway that's being proposed in, uh, for London to encourage uh, alternative modes of transportation. I, I just came from Copenhagen uh, a week or so ago, and there it's incredible what they have. You know, there are whole highway lanes that are just filled with bicycles. And so what happens is, you know, folks want to go for this, but they don't necessarily understand how. Now, an abundant perspective, I would argue, and you hear this with sustainability, you've also heard, you'll hear this talked about the three Ps, the triple bottom line, um, people will talk about all these things, but they hardly ever tell you what in the world are they really talking about. So when you look at this, um, the abundant perspective takes uh, you know, into account people as well as the planet and profitability. And now what you're going for here, as you look at all the various ways this can unfold, there's, there's several meta categories which, with which you can categorize this. So on the people side, what you're really trying to do is you're trying to improve the workplace, build community, or solve social issues. Now, granted, there are a million ways. Everyone in this room is doing these things out there in their communities. But really, you can roll up these categories into, the, into these three areas. On the planet side, what you're talking about is either reducing waste, which we make an enormous amount of, um, using waste as a resource, and we'll talk more about that later. Or regenerating natural capital, figuring out ways, similar to an organic farmer, that having, uh, having the things, the activities that you're doing are actually enriching the soil or the planet as, as part of what is going on. Now, when you're doing this right, and this is the tricky part, is as well, 
On the profit side, what this can do is this will reduce risk for companies, cut costs, and potentially grow sales. Now, the idea here, when this is working well, all three of these things are acting in a virtuous cycle, right? And so, and I'll show you some examples of what I'm talking about in just a minute, but so things that you're doing to improve the workplace are also helping you either reduce risk, cut costs, improve profitability, or reducing waste, et cetera. Now, when you start looking at all the activities that you're doing through this lens, it provides a new perspective. And what I'm trying to do here, and this piece I talked to you about earlier about with perspective, is you want to be able to have multiple conversations. Right? You want to be able to have a conversation with an activist and talk about the things that you're doing maybe over here or over here, but you also want to be able to talk to someone in the business community and explain to them, well, no, these things, it's not a zero-sum game. It's not that if you help people out, you're automatically hurting your company. It's in fact that these things can all work together and, and enhance the whole picture. And there's been, we don't have time for it in this talk, um, but there's lots of studies that show that companies that are out there that consider all the stakeholders actually far outperform uh, their peers. Um, and I, I should also just mention, when I'm talking about companies or enterprises, I am talking about for-profit, non-profit, small enterprises, large scalable companies. I'm using that term to encompass all of those things. I mean, certainly many people in the nonprofit sector, um, the nonprofits that I've worked in at least, and many others, they're always struggling, struggling to figure out business model funding and could use some of these tools. And likewise, the, the for-profit companies need to be listening to the folks in the nonprofit sector because they're identifying the problems, which if you flip them around are also huge opportunities that are out there. But we'll talk more about that in a minute. So the idea, is you're running everything through this perspective. Everybody with me so far? We're doing all right? All right. So, so here is, if you break down any organization, you can basically have these six pieces here. And Jim was talking before about the webs, and you'll see how this all comes together. So let me just explain to you what happens here. Every organization, again, for-profit, non-profit, large or small, has different competitive strengths. They have different things that they do really well. So here on the inbound is you are receiving goods, operations, um, you are turning goods or services into something, you are distributing them down out here into outbound, so you're getting them out there to your clients. Um, you have some kind of marketing program or raising awareness about what you're trying to do. You most likely provide some sort of service after you're in a community um, or, 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 or you have a product. And one thing that we've added in here is unsold production. Previously, when people have looked at this model, which was called a value chain, it was a linear model. And so you did not consider unsold production. And most people call this waste. But if you start thinking about this as things you're producing but not selling, it kind of changes the whole equation around. Now, if you look at this on the larger scale where you're tying all these pieces together, this is what this looks like. So you have all these aspects of the business right here, and you are looking at them on their environmental as well as social and profit performance on each of these levels. Now keep in mind, what, if you stop for a moment and think about your organization, you don't do all of these things really well. You probably do one or at most two of them really well. All right? And so those are your areas of competitive strength. But what you need to be doing is running all those areas through that abundant perspective to figure out what, where new opportunities lie. And so when you break this down, this is a simpler version of the abundance cycle. So now I'm going to take you through this with companies from industrial giants to startups to nonprofits, so you get an idea of how companies can apply this. So let's just look at GE. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. The, uh, GE has an eco-imagination division, um, and which, they, which all they do is they produce uh, products and services designed to lower energy costs, um, are for renewable energy, and other things. And you'll notice up here, these, there are some symbols up here, and we'll talk about these in a little bit. These are different tactics that companies or, or nonprofits are using, and I'll get to those. But, so in GE, as I was talking about, they produce windmills and other things. To give you an idea of the, the size and scale of this, 
is they've had $160 billion in sales. When you hear the people from GE talking, and I know you'll love this line, they talk about green is green. When you are saving people money, um, it also makes for good sales opportunities. Um, and so this division of GE alone, if it was its, a standalone company, this would be a Fortune 150 company. Um, just to give you, a, again, a sense of the size and scale. Now, while they've been in operation, and even though they've produced $160 billion in additional sales, they've reduced their gross greenhouse gas emissions by 32%. So that is not emissions per dollar sold. That is net greenhouse gas emissions. Right? So even though they're selling more, they're using a lot less resources. So that's great for GE, and they're an enormous, an enormous multinational company. Let's look at a different level. I'm sure you're all familiar with Grameen Bank, right, and Mohamed Yunus, Nobel Peace Prize winner, um, you know, the father of micro lending, arguably. Um, now, Grameen, what they did is they revolutionized the outbound of banking, right? They figured out a new way to get the, the goods and, and the service of banking distributed out there to people um, and loaned in incredibly small amounts. Now, they've loaned over $11 billion. Well, they've loaned 11 billion, but they've probably launched an industry that's done over 100 billion. Um, and so, but it is incredible. They've had 8.3 million clients, uh, including the poorest of the poor, and they've been profitable all but three years since their founding. They have a 97% repayment rate. Now, for those of you who are from the US, and you think back to the mortgage crisis, um, where we were the, supposedly the most credit worthy people in the entire world um, and we're having double digit default rates and here you have Grameen Bank loaning to the poorest of the poor, the uncredit worthy and they have a 97% repayment rate. It really makes you stop and take pause. Um, and here you can see they were dealing mainly with micro enterprise which is this symbol right here as well as the, the base of the pyramid which we'll talk about in a minute. Now, one of the most exciting areas that's happening is, this, is what they call the collaborative economy. And so, and what this is, is this is companies that are selling solutions to your problems versus selling you a product. So what, what Sunrun does is they will pay the upfront cost to put solar panels on your house or your office, and then you will pay them back over time and they'll make their profit that way and they'll, be, and they'll provide you with the upfront capital. This model, is being used in everything from solar panels uh, to textbooks to if you get your movies off of Netflix, they're using this model. Um, and it's also being used in, the, um, in development work. There's a company called Village Infrastructure that's using the same, what they call a power purchase agreement, the same model, but in rural, uh, rural villages. Airbnb, which you may know about, I mean, is, is an, another model doing this. This is more the peer-to-peer -peer model which means I have spare resources, and so I'm gonna lend them out to other peers. And this is an amazing statistic here. You know, last night, 40,000 people rented accommodations from a service that offers 250,000 rooms in 30,000 cities in 192 countries, right? And that's all peer-to-peer -peer sharing and people making more use of the assets that they have. Now, to give you an idea of how powerful this model is, I don't, have you all heard of Uber? Mm -hmm. All right, so Uber, um, which, um, really, what their magic is, they it's a car pickup service, is all it is. It's like a taxi cab, except you can order it, track it on your phone, um, and it allows people to use their own cars to pick up other people. They recently went public um, and were valued at about $17 billion. Now, you can see here, which you, it's kind of tough to see here, that was slightly above United Airlines, uh, Alcoa <laughs> Aluminum, Sony, Hardly Davidson, Hertz, Whirlpool's way down here at only $11 billion. Um, so uh, Hertz, the car rental company. So just to give you an idea, and what people are, are buying here is not, it's not the fact that they're excited that someone is picking you up at the door. What it is, it's facilitating this peer-to-peer -peer sharing and enabling this much more efficient use of resources. Now, the island I was talking about on, uh, that where I just was was Samso, and their 2.0 version is to become a fossil-free island in about the next 10 to 20 years. Um, and so they want to get rid of all fossil fuels on the island. And the incredible thing about SAMHSA is um, 
they have done this through uh, crowdsourcing and crowd sharing. And so local community investment is what's driving um, all of the upgrades in renewable energy and other things. And they're also doing things like they have a district heating plant. So for those of you who live in the US and have a boiler in your basement that you're feeding fossil fuels, <laughs> what they've done on SAMSO is they have one heating plant that feeds the whole town. And they power that with agricultural waste from the farms. And so instead of the money going offshore, it's going back into their local community to support the farmers and other people in agriculture who would otherwise just be composting that waste. So I mean, it's really an incredible story. Now, as you all know, we have incredible amounts of garbage. And we have incredible amounts of waste. It is the statistic that I've heard often quoted is after about six months, roughly only 1% of everything that is dig up, dug up, produced, is still in use. So 99% of everything else is waste. And so when you start looking and thinking about this as unsold production, there is huge opportunities here. And the one that I want to share with you is this, this uh, organization that some of you may know of, and they went out and they, they saw all this waste from the, the, the one, one liter bottles. And they, and they figured out that if you uh, put some corrugated around them and filled them up with water and a bleach solution, you could do something like this, which in shanty towns, um, and especially in places, and, and the places I think, one of the places where they really got going was the Philippines. I think it was actually invented in Brazil, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, and so now inside during the day, which where it was really dark, now you have the ability to have light. And they call it a liter of light, right? <laughs> now, and there is a 2.0 version of this now using solar and LEDs and really simple battery technology. And it's called a liter of light at night. They've got, they've got a very good name. Um, and so now you can provide street light, lighting using this same model. And I guess the average life of one of these bottles is about five years, right? And so you're taking something that is trash and, and turning it into a useful product. And that is, and again, going back to that, that what you were talking about before about this perspective of scarcity or abundance, right? So this is saying, what do I have around me and how can I change how can I look at what I have and use that to remake the world around me? Now, uh, Leader of Light, they're in about a dozen countries, and they're shooting to be in about a million homes uh, by about 2015. So I just want to move over here quickly. And, and so you've seen a lot of these little symbols here. Um, and I want to talk to you about these tactics. So what, what these tactics are, these are specific tactics that companies can use so we talked about we had that hexagon, right? And you had your competitive strength. And these are tactics that you can, any company or organization, for-profit, non-profit, can use to start thinking about how can I recreate what I'm doing? And to give you an idea of how powerful this is, uh, I looked at the auto industry, okay? Just to give you a sense of size and scale of the auto industry. And you would think, like, that industry is not known for you know, quick, rapid changes, right? It's really expensive to operate. Uh, the five, if you combine the sales of the five largest auto companies, it would be the 20th largest economy on the planet. Okay, that's the five largest auto companies. They would be in the G20. It's about a two and a half trillion dollar industry. And so what I wanted to see was, could you do this kind of thing? Would this idea of abundance, could it happen? In, in such a huge industry, we have gigantic competitive barriers. And what you see is that people are figuring this out in bits and pieces all over the world. Um, so people, this tactic here, waste is food. So this is taking your unsold production and using it as a resource, like we saw with the leader of light. Um, people are doing this. Um, there's a whole movement around vehicle to grid, where you have, um, where you have solar panels or renewable energy charging car batteries that then also can also act as a stabilizer for the grid. In the US, if you added up all the storage capacity of all the car, car batteries, it's actually bigger than the grid. The sharing economy we talked about, and so you have company like Relay Rides, where you have peer-to-peer -peer sharing, and I can rent you my, auto, my, my car on, on a short-term basis. 
Um, the idea of radical resource productivity, getting more by, by using less. Um, this is a truck from, of all people, Walmart. Uh, Walmart has an abominable social record, um, but they are doing some incredible things on the environmental side um, simply because they understand it saves them money. They're doing it from sort of a pure, you know, the purest kind of, you know, this helps my business because I save money. Um, and this is a new truck that they've designed uh, that will save them millions of dollars in fuel costs. They're also doing this with LEDs in their stores, redesigning packaging, and a whole lot of other things. Uh, building natural capital. This is actually a, a former student of mine, uh, Nick Harris, who's getting his PhD at Berkeley. Um, and when he was at College of the Atlantic, uh, we have an enterprise incubator there for sustainable enterprises. And he was in there, and he started this company called Gourmet Butanol. Um, the idea was, uh, we live on an island, right? The college is located on Mount Desert Island, which is connected by a causeway to the mainland. But what we do with our trash is we truck it all up into the middle of Maine, where they burn it in an incinerator. Now, it does not make a whole lot of sense to take organic waste, like food waste, which is mostly water, right, to, and take that off and burn it. So Nick started developing this process to turn food waste into compost and to a, a fuel called butanol. Um, and he started this at COA, and now he's getting his PhD at Berkeley, um, continuing to work on this process. We also talked about um, the, the bike highway in London and this idea that through your enterprise, you can actually not only be not a negative, you can actually restore uh, natural capital. Biomimicry is another huge thing. And the idea here is that you look to nature to solve the problems that you're looking at because nature has been looking at this uh, for millions of years, right? Or, or, or actually much, much longer than that. Um, and so here you have the bullet train in Japan, which was actually inspired by a hummingbird's beak. Um, if, if any of you have Velcro on a, on a jacket, that was inspired by, you know, burrs. Or in wind turbines, they're looking at uh, whale fins and how the, the whales go through the water and, and to use that to help them to design more efficient wind turbines. Um, on the solutions economy side, there are companies like this company uh, makes these little pod cars, which are in about four or five places in the U.S. and internationally in the United Arab Emirates. There's one in, in South Korea as well where you can just get in the car and it'll take you to where you need to go uh, versus owning a car. On the micro enterprise side, uh, this is a company called Clean Engines that's in the Philippines and they're taking, they're trying to tackle the pollution problem from motorcycles and also making the motorcycles much more efficient so people with small businesses can one, afford to retrofit their motorcycle and two, spend a lot less money on fuel and three, have it improve their health. Um, on the, at the base of the pyramid, companies like Tata are experimenting with a compressed air car that, um, that families can afford in India. And I don't, that project seems to be you know, a little touch and go at the moment. Um, and, and for all of these things, I should mention that none of this means that you will ultimately be successful. You will have all the regular issues that you have with any kind of startup company or business. This is not a panacea, you will have to make difficult choices, but these are ways that you can move forward. On the crowding, Fiat uh, launched this car called the Mio. It's a completely crowdsourced car um, that, they, that they designed. There are new entities forming, so new kinds of business, be they cooperatives or B Corps or public-private partnerships, like that produced this streetcar in Oregon, which um, it reestablished this business for trolley cars um, in Portland, Oregon. Um, as well, you have companies that are redefining their customer experience. Tesla, um, which all of you have probably heard of, has completely design, redesigned what it's like not only to make a car, but also to buy a car and to own a car. They've restructured the whole, the whole experience. And finally, this last one down here, regenerative marketing. You know, what does that mean, regenerative marketing, right? That, that marketing is oftentimes derided is, you know, one of the most wasteful activities that you can have. You're, I mean, on the worst side, you're kind of tricking people to buy your product, some would say. Um, the idea behind regenerative marketing is what if you redirected your marketing dollars? 
to actually be a positive force out there in the world. Um, can you imagine if you, you, the, the marketing spend was redirected to create new kinds of products, engage the community? Um, there's a billboard in Peru now that is, that is actually cleaning air pollution from construction sites. Um, and there are lots of different examples of this. In the transportation sector, you have companies like, um, like City that are sponsoring uh, bike sharing stations uh, in New York. And so they're redirecting marketing dollars. Yes, they're still getting their name out there, they're still marketing, but it's actually doing a net positive for the community. And then there are other companies like Toyota with their iRoad that are combining a whole bunch of these different tactics, or Honda, uh, not surprisingly, these two companies are really far ahead of everybody else. Honda is looking at how your entire house can be a battery, um, including the way, including your car, so the whole thing can feed back into the grid. Um, so some really incredible stuff going on there in, in this enormous industry. So, um, so I want to just talk to you quickly about the kind of five steps and just do a, a quick review of where we've been. Um, for companies or any organization thinking about doing this, the first thing you need to figure out is why do you exist? What are you doing out there? What is your purpose? Most people establish a company or an enterprise or an organization to solve a problem. Certainly, that's indicative of everybody I've talked to in the room today, right? And uh, what IPM is doing and what, men, but what many people do is they, they see a problem and then they try to solve it. Um, you should figure out what are your competitive strengths? Where on this abundance cycle uh, are your strengths? And you should focus on those areas and then go through and use those tactics that we've been talking about uh, just a moment ago and look at the new solutions. How can you come up with designs that solve a problem? How can you, if you were to reimagine your company as using waste as a resource, what would that look like? Or if you were to focus on problems at the base of the pyramid, how would that change what you're doing? Um, and then the, the communication piece is really key, and I talked about this a little bit, but you need to make sure you're communicating with people in a language they can hear. So if you're talking to the chief financial officer, you had better be talking about investment returns. If you're talking with people in the community, you better be addressing their concerns and their needs. And the needs are coming at you from all different angles, but you need to understand and communicate with people in their own language. And finally, you do need to have some sort of measurement um, and so you can report out what's going on as well as repeat it. Now, we've developed, you saw the business model canvas at the beginning. Um, this is a, a canvas for the abundance cycle that takes you through all the steps with the company purpose, talking about your areas of competitive advantage, and it spells out what is happening in each of these areas around here, as well as the three Ps, and what, what are people really saying when they talk about sustainability or this thing called the triple bottom line to help give you some definition. Um, and you can download this at AbundanceCycle.com and print it out and use it and help you chart out your course so you don't end up like Biscuit, you know, running into a wall and causing all kinds of problems for yourself and more importantly for others. Um, you can also, there's an article written on this in Triple Pundit you can check out. Um, and I guess with that, I'd like to wrap up and invite the respondents to, to come on up and, uh, and respond. I'd I'm curious to hear their questions. Yeah. So I am introducing uh, about our work. I am coming from India, and I am representing Pochabai Foundation. So Pochabai Foundation was born out of inspiration and motivation of Pochabai, who sacrificed his life for his Dalit community on 25th January 1986. It is a local level voluntary organization formed by like-minded individual, professional, and committed social worker. I, uh, history of Golana Massacre, the history and truth behind the massacre is the, they were introvertial caste socially, economically, politically, physically, and mentally discrimination and exploitation of the low, ca low caste by the high caste community.
community. Dalit were economically, socially, and politically deprived, backward, and vulnerable. I am talking about Pochawai Foundation, and we are doing in our area focusing in Dalit rights. But I say you doing only rights based activities. So you are uh, in in community. You are not give uh, your uh, you not give justice. So we have started right based activities and economical activities. So we have formation youth groups, women groups, and we have started many economical activities. In our women's, we have started that sewing classes because they teach the tailoring course. We have uh, uh, give training, so then they they got on for uh, work and uh, got on for their uh, village. We have started beauty parlor courses because in villages they have no beauty parlor and that women then not go to cities area because they are far away and uh, women are basically they are a poor poor community so we have teach the uh, girls for beauty parlors so they establish their own uh, small uh, they are working in their own house <coughs> and they earn some money for their own uh, uh. so other we have started com uh, computer center for our youth and uh, girls also we give training to computer literacy so that they got good job in companies and other offices. And also we have to teach our community because our community is a uh, farmers. Their occupation is uh, farming. So we have uh, give training to organic, uh, organic uh, farming. We have give training to making organic manure, organic pesticides, and uh, how to do organic farming. And then we have to, uh, to teach them, and they apply uh, their, their farm also. And we, we form some uh, farmer groups so that they collect their own uh, on uh, crops and we uh, we est we uh, we are uh, in uh, in one village they are collecting the crops and then we we sell because they uh, get good price on their uh, 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 crops so Another, we have started working in uh, our tribal area. They are uh, local healers, and they are making medicines like uh, diabetes, jaundice, kidney stone, and many diseases for uh, body. So they are collect herbs in forest area. We have cultivate many herbs in their own field on boundary and they making good medicines so we are helping to marketing their medicines we are helping to uh, that uh, we are not in, uh, in uh, we are not uh, we are giving marketing skill we are giving good uh, they are packaging and all that they are like good so that marketing is upgrading so we are strongly be, uh, in thought 
our our thinking you are uh, you are working only for rice based activities but you are not doing in economically and uh, activities so you are not give justice for your uh, your uh, community so uh, i request mahesh bhai to say something add for my okay yeah okay thank you yeah i could just add just one or two things uh, in terms of uh, yeah yeah should i go so just uh, the reason why we are looking at this connection uh, with the presentation that was done by you and this is the point that we are trying to make that commerce and concern can merge together and they need to merge and this is something that i constantly uh, engage human rights groups with it's not enough to just talk about rights based group but we need to learn how especially if you're discussing with socially and economically backward groups how do you become part of the market and compete with businesses so one thing is value based uh, is something that i want to add to what you had already presented yeah. earlier uh, the other thing is like it's not enough to talk about micro credit we have to put it into a socio economic context as far as uh, ipm is concerned as far as our partners is concerned so i think it's a good di dialogue uh, process between business commerce and the industry and uh, uh, groups like us i think there is a meeting point and we need to develop this further and i i don't want to take away from what he's saying but uh, uh, just to add to that for that uh, when even if you talk about micro credit who does it actually benefit how does it benefit these are areas that we need to explore a little bit yeah and the reason is this i mean the reason why we started conversing on this economic activities is that uh, like gramin bank we have uh, other credit groups in india and uh, i personally me and my family had to rescue 18 uh, children mm -hmm. under the age of 15 who were sent to baroda which is on the west coast of india because their parents were agriculture workers on the east coast of india like calcutta where mother teresa lives were not able to repay their micro credit loans mm -hmm. so how do you bring about a human face to work right space work and to micro enterprise yeah. these are some of the things that i think i'm just like to add and put it into the context i hope that it <laughs> absolutely you need you, you still have to think about like micro credits a great example because there's people who have done it really well and there are people who have done it completely exploitatively so you you've got to be thinking about both those sides and you know the thing with the profitability piece is the profits are power and so someone is going to use them and you would much have the, rather have someone using them to do social good and benefit and having it in, enrich those organizations so they can do more of that work versus the social organizations be starving all the time and not able to get out you know get, not able to get their mission out so yeah it's a great point yeah please okay well my name is rodrigo i am from brazil i work for the struggle for the land rural agrarian reform landless together with via campesina which is an umbrella for peasants movement around the world and also on a big coalition nowadays in Brazil regarding to the mining issues we are just preparing in Brasilia a Latin American meeting on churches and mining because of the impacts of all this uh, it was uh, very interesting the the presentation especially from the point of view of business i just would like to make some points just to interact uh i think there's a risk in 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 this perspective as thinking as business as usual we we have some challenges nowadays we know we know all the fields of environmental justice we know that the the impacts I, i i don't like the word of uh, environmental impacts they are environment conflicts because most of them are caused by us mm -hmm. the inter our, our interference maybe a volcano would make a, 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 a an environmental impact so but they are taken from different the impacts are, are different from different regions in the world the the other issue is To, to approach to this is the common goods the common goods of humanity and the common goods of the nature 
There's a whole discussion in the social movements around the world and from different, this is what we've been hearing, uh, that we need to stress. There's a different vision. And this vision, if we think from the perspective of Latin America, uh, we have a whole, I don't know in English, maybe this is the cosmovision of the uh, uh, indigenous people in the Andes, uh, what they call bien, vi bien vivir, uh, living well. Mm -hmm. It's a completely different set of mind. We, we just can't keep thinking on the hegemonic way of living. Mm -hmm. There are different ways of living in the world. One is hegemonic. Uh, but this is different. And the other one is the, the, the rights of nature. If we see the constitution of Bolivia, if we see the constitution of Ecuador, they're talking about the rights of nature, the nature itself. From a religious perspective, and, as, and, and even as a Christian perspective, there, there is, a, 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 and as a Franciscan I would say, uh, each being has its own dignity uh, in relation. And if we see from a, uh, I will mix a little bit, I know in, in, in some audience it doesn't work, but I think on our audience can work. If we say that uh, God's incarnate and became a human being, so he became nature because we are nature. It has its own dignity. So when I look to a territory, I don't only see the biodiversity, the physical, but there is culture, there is history, there is also religions. So there's bio and social diversity. How to deal with this? Those solutions, for me, they come from more from a, a perspective that someone who sees nature's capital, uh, environment as a stock of the capital, and the value is given f by the future flow of ecosystem service. This is, this is all the, the fields of green, uh, green economy that started uh, from, from the TE, TEB, the, the so-called uh, economic and ecosystem, and, uh, economy of ecosystem and biodiversity. It's, it started in 2007 during the, at that time was the, the five big ones in Germany, they asked for this research to see how the impacts could be measured on an economic perspective. For me, sustainability is, is a sustainability of life. We're gonna find the place of economy inside, but life is the first. And then we see that uh, they started talking about living beings and the relations, interactions in between and the environment, which we leave those interactions with all the organisms and then in the environment. And they start talking about services and measuring and put value. And then we have all the market of a carbon credits, which for me just produce two types of new property titles is the titles of the diox uh, carbon that was retained and from the forest that is, uh, 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 that is immobilized. And, and those who are living there. Just now in the climate change, the, the last climate change meeting at the UN, they started, but this has come from the 2010, as a vision of climate smart agriculture and they're selling it to Africa. This is business. Big companies. Those who are producing climate change are now, climate change became a market, became a market, mm -hmm. a new market. And you can imagine those populations that for hundreds and hundreds of years that have relation with the nature, I'm thinking on small farming, family farming, mm -hmm. If you don't have this relation, you lose. Mm -hmm. You have to have, you have to, to adapt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
where I live, it's, in, uh, it's related to savannas. We have just two, two uh, uh, seasons, the, the, the dry and the rain. So you have to survive with this and diversity. Because if you lose here, you win here. So it's a completely set of mind. Agriculture is not a package of technology, economy, and industrial inputs, but it's a way of being organized on a mm -hmm. territory. Mm -hmm. It's life. Mm -hmm. so, so when I see those, uh, I, 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 I understand. We have a fear. I have. <laughs> uh, that something must be changed. And then we keep talking about the ab abundance. What means abundance? Or dignity? Or living, uh, living well? Abundance, at least in our culture, Western culture, what is it? Growth. Mm. And growth and development connected to the economic growth. Mm. And this is the, the, one of the big issues of the, the sustainability. Everything towards profit and not towards a, a solidary economy where you have local development and self-management and solidarity uh, on our activities. Because activities, they can be sharing. I can imagine when we talk about land. We had a big struggle. We had a meeting in 2000 here in Washington because of, of the so, of the so-called market-based land reform. Mm -hmm. and the World Bank invented this with Brazil, exported to South Africa. Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and can you imagine where the land is communal? Mm -hmm. So this is a completely, I think what we need is to have a different approach. I know that it doesn't change like this. And, and that's why I'm, I'm not saying this is completely out. This can be a way of, of doing. But if you don't approach, and I would invite all of you this year uh, in Geneva, uh, we were participating on a, on a huge coalition of NGOs, and then Ecuador passed uh, a request, and we, we won something extremely important, which is the UN recognized the necessity of an international binding treaty, treaty on TNCs, transnational corporations. Mm -hmm. They were building what they call the guidance of principles, but this is op optional. And this is a kind of self-regulation because you're taking the power of, this, of the single states to control. But when you see the impacts and human rights impacts of all those transnational companies and all the issues that we have, we have a huge multinational, Brazilian multinational called Vale for mining and, it, and it's working in Mozambique and we see all the, the problems causing there. What we hope is that when they sue uh, uh, Valley, they will sue in Rio de Janeiro. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like Chevron, and all the and now the struggle that Ecuador is having. You know, so I think we have we okay. We we need to think in these solutions because we we. we the machine is working, is moving, but we need to put different approaches and, and, and try maybe slowly to overcome and give possibilities for different ways of living mm -hmm. and different of ways of, uh, mm -hmm. of looking. And don't think them as something that should be at the museums, mm -hmm. anthropology museums and everything. Because I think solutions there are local solutions that can be in, 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 in chain uh, overcome. Otherwise, we're going we're gonna to be keeping. Because I don't know if, we, if uh, 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 we want to, to give up some facilities we have. Mm -hmm. So we always, it's, it's not a technology, a technology issue. 
I understand and I agree. But most of these are technology. Mm -hmm. I would disagree with that. I mean, I actually agree with most of what you're saying. Oh, thank you. So, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I actually think that it fits together really well with what I'm saying, yeah, yeah. because you know some of the things you're talking about, the new perspectives, and you know, like the community development piece, local control, all those things are things that companies are doing. And if I had, you know, if we wanted to be here all night, I mean, you could have endless examples of that happening. I mean, one example on Samso. You know, that was a community-driven process of local control to remake their, um, remake their world. I also think that what I'm presenting here is not an endorsement of, you know, large-scale corporate and industrial capitalism. The one point which I think I do have some issue with is around growth, and I think it's not whether or not you want to grow, but what do you want to grow? Mm -hmm. What kind of world do you want to see? Because if you have the organizations that you're talking about coming together and those people establishing those business, that's growth. If you have indigenous communities taking over their lands and doing something or a community control of an issue or a reestablishment of a commons, that's growth. But it's what you want to grow. I agree with you completely, and I said this in the talk, that you know, right now business is the present agent of destruction. But the question is, can we realign things fast enough so you're considering all those other factors as well as things that you brought in which are you know like what's happening in Bolivia and what's happening in, a, in other countries with declarations of rights around nature I also don't as, as a sort of a finer point I don't necessarily agree on like the classifying ecosystem services I think people are doing that to be able to communicate with people who only see things in a dollars and cents manner while um, the issue is much broader than that and much more philosophical and values based. But again, I think it, what's important and what I've seen is you have to be able to communicate on about 75 different levels. And I think what, you, the, what you're presenting here, I, I wholeheartedly you know, agree with those, some of those points, if, if that makes sense. But I, I appreciate the comments. It's really mm -hmm. yeah. uh, thought provoking. Just to finish, uh, when, I, uh, when I talk about the ecosystems and the services, when you put a price, someone is going to own. And this is not theory and not, and not philosophy. This is concrete for those who are there. For those who are there. Carbon credits, it's extremely unjust. And there are markets for this. this, is in this it's in the same logic. Well, and markets aren't the solution for every problem, certainly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've seen that. I mean, that's, yeah. that's an argument that's, you know, dead and buried. But there are times when things like, you know, if you look at acid rain in Ohio, where we are right now, and in Pennsylvania, where I grew up, I mean, there was a market for, you know, socks and NOx and, and nitrogen and sulfur in the atmosphere, and that fundamentally changed the way that... Uh, you know, that they were able to come up with solutions much faster because there was a price put on it. I'm not saying it's, you need, and carbon, if in one of the things, if you look at what's happening in Denmark and Europe, is they're making people pay carbon taxes, which is spurring all sorts of new technology to enable growth without the environmental, uh, without as much environmental degradation. So I agree with you, markets aren't always a solution. The carbon one we may have to talk about a little more. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. <laughs> or, or Can I stop for now? How to make it more just? I mean, I mean, I guess you said it was fundamentally, or I, I, I would say there are some struggles that we need to to be aware of. One is uh, the organization of the of the workers, uh, uh, the Convention One Sixty Nine. Indigenous people they have the right to say no. I don't want this type of business in my in my area. The people should have the rights to veto for mining in some areas. You can ima imagine fracking. Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're absolutely here. Yeah. So, so, so I think it's the approach. If you approach from an econo economic perspective only, then you give you you leave. Uh, uh, what I'm saying is, you leave those, these uh, areas open, and you're not gonna overcome. I don't, I don't disagree with that. And, okay. no, you know, yeah, yeah. and if you look I'm at just, policy... I'm just adding. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we should let Peter get awarded. Well, I, <laughs> I, thank you for being so patient. Peter. No, I, I, was, I was brought in as a spare wheel, really. <laughs>
And you know, the principle of spare wheel is that the other wheel must get a puncture first before you're used. <laughs> and as far as I can see, all the wheels here are <laughs> doing pretty well, so maybe I should. Uh, uh, the phone is also. <laughs> Actually, to tell you the truth, I was. Um, I was very. very taken in by Jay's analysis. And, 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 and I identify myself with Biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. The sleepwalking dog. Because Dorothy and will, will know that a lot of businesses have tried my hands and ended up like Biscuit. <laughs> and I see so many Biscuits in my, in my county that I wish Jay could find some time through the uh, help of IPM to come and just help us get out of this sleepwalking business. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many of you have read Hernando de Soto's book, Dead Capital. Hernando de Soto, the Latin American economist, wrote this thing on dead capital, which is extremely interesting. It's kind of related to a lot of things that Jay is talking about. What Hernando was saying, and Hernando was eventually hired by the Tanzanian government to go and advise them on, on revitalizing the Tanzanian economy, particularly the agricultural sector. What Hernando was saying is that the, the problem we have in developing countries is not that we don't have money, but we have a lot of dead capital, <coughs> particularly in agriculture. For example, we have a lot of land, but it can't be capitalized. For example, in my county, people have a lot of land which do not have title deeds. And when you have title to the land, you can take the title deed to the bank and get some loan, and with that loan you can develop it. But because you have the land and there's no title deed, it's, it's dead capital. <clears throat> but there's another example which is more, even more interesting in that actually people have a lot of money in the countryside, but they don't know how to use it to do business or to create wealth. I'll give you an example. A couple of weeks ago, a group of women came to my office in Kisumu. Kisumu is the capital of, of, of our county. And they found my manager there and said, we want to see the senator. I said, the senator is not here, but he's coming back. He's coming here on Friday. So we made an appointment on Friday. I came, these women came in and said, look, we had the women and men. We had 42 women groups in one ward. A ward is part of a whole constituency or a sub-county. And uh, these 42 women groups have been doing table banking. You know what table banking is all about? Table banking is, like its name suggests, you collect money on a table. <laughs> <laughs> and you lend it among yourselves. And women are very good at this because they don't break the rule. You lend it, you are supposed to use it and pay it back in an, in, with interest to the group. And so it circulates among the group. The interest grows, the money grows, but you also do business with it. Self-help. Self -help. Now, it depends on the kind of business you are doing. The women are very good. Uh, they do all kinds of businesses. But a point comes when the interest has grown so much that they don't know how to use the money. Now, this was the case in the, with the people who came to my office. So look, we have 42 groups. And now our capital base, as it were, the money we have and the interest we have grown is now 92 million Kenyan shillings. That's a million dollar plus, just in a sub-county. So they came to me asking me, what do we do? We can no longer handle this money. I didn't know what they could do. So I told them, look, fortunately I know somebody who is specialized in this area. Some lady in Nairobi who has been advising groups on forming savings and credit corporate, cooperative organization. So you go from table banking to saving and credit cooperative organization, which I understand from this woman is a better arrangement than just having table banking. And I believed her because I see a lot of circles doing a lot of things. I belong to a circle in, in, in parliament 
and, and, and I borrow a lot of money from the SACO and we do it. And I think SACO is a good idea because I have benefited. So I invited this lady to go and, 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 and meet these women and they said, look, we don't need any money from you. You just bring the lady. Please don't come with this idea of giving us money that politicians do. We don't need money from you. We need some good ideas on how we use this money. So I didn't believe them either, but <laughs> so we went. And the day was fantastic. I mean, I also told the member of parliament for the area and the women representative and told them, look, this thing is happening in your area and you don't know, so let's go. So we went and they had organized a fantastic day, tents all over the place, huge. There must have been over a thousand people there, members of the groups. And this woman had met them before that day and had told them how the circle was going to be implemented and had come that day to launch the circle. And they had understood what the circle was doing and they were very excited. And they organized the day themselves. We just went to preside over the launching of the circle. And the circle was launched, bringing together these 42 groups into one circle with a capital base of $1 million in the rural areas. Now the thing was, how are they going to use this money? Then I went to another circle in another part of the country where I, IPM, IPM is working in Machakos. And there the women have decided to get their money and put it into a building, hoping that this building, they will rent the offices and get money from the offices, which is, may work or may not work. Because it depends on what the real estate market is like. So I told this woman, look, what is really the basic problem in this area? Our, the basic problem in this area is always food production and food marketing. Uh, for example, we have supermarkets in Kisumu which get vegetables as far away as uh, Limuru. So by the time it comes, it's very expensive. Whereas, as you know, Elaine, uh, there's rich farming area. If only you take the water from the river and you irrigate, you produce a lot of money, not just for domestic consumption, but for export to the Middle East because you now have an international market in Kisumu. And there's a lot of demand for some agricultural produce in the Middle East and in South Sudan for that matter. So this woman told them, look, we are not going to go the way of the Machakos women. That may be dead capital <laughs> very soon. They're going to go away in which you actually have a market that will give you profit. And that will also make you self-sufficient in food production at home. So you'll be having food you can eat. Now, come another aspect of it. You are talking about commercializing uh, climate change. Uh, there is a, a trend of things in Kenya of advising people in agriculture to go green housing. Now, green housing is okay if you have the capital, because the greenhouse itself is very expensive. Very. And the inputs and so on. I've gone green housing, I know it. <laughs> but anyway, the thing is that uh, if you have the capital, you can go green housing. But telling these my women to go green housing may be hazardous. So the thing is that if they partner with the county government, where the county government, as a government, put some money in infrastructure so that they don't have to bear the weight of the infrastructure. Like the greenhouses will be cheaper because the, the county government is subsidizing. And I strongly believe myself in subsidizing agriculture. I think agriculture is extremely difficult to capitalize and can only be successful if it's subsidized. I hope I'm right. Everywhere I see the history of ride of even agriculture in Europe is highly subsidized. And yet the World Bank is telling Africans not to subsidize agriculture, the government. I think the only way that we can make in the is to have that kind of subsidized agriculture. Fortunately, agriculture is now under county government, and county governments are, have not yet been influenced by the World Bank and IMF, and I think they can go that direction. So the idea we are having at the moment is that this former dead capital can be translated into living capital for these women to go into agricultural production for both domestic consumption and export with an arrangement where the county government subsidizes the infrastructure, like the greenhouses themselves. That's why I'm saying that I think uh, we will get out of being biscuits <laughs> and do something that Jay has in mind, which is transforming the dead capital and living capital. And I would like to appeal to IPM 
that maybe your next trip to Kenya, bring Jay with you. <laughs> <laughs> so that we can, he can deal with these uh, potential biscuits <laughs> in Kisumu County, especially these women. I think they have a fantastic potential for being fantastic agents for rural transformation because they're already cap capable of raising the capital themselves. Thank you. Yeah. May I do a comment? Uh, yeah, I think so. Just, How are, we, are we okay on... Yeah, just one. I, I'm wondering why for the banks, communal land is that capital. Yeah. And titling is necessary. Yeah. We had a discussion with the development minister of Germany. And then we, we, were, we were saying, of course titling is important because it's based on property, mm -hmm. on private property. And if you don't pay, you can get back. Yeah, well, so I mean, one thing it's very simple. Of course, it's much more, yeah. but it's the guarantee for the bank, not for the community. And, and so the question is, how do yeah, you work your way around that? That's and, right. And you know, otherwise and, and you're going to destroy your culture. Okay. Well, no, but like in Switzerland, yeah. not that far from Germany, yeah. they have a long history of and tradition of the commons. Yeah. And so. Or there are other ways to do it, like providing a guarantee. Like we were in local economic development in the United States. Um, one thing people are doing is providing, you know, bank guarantees That's to right. backstop yeah. a loan. Yeah. So you could have something in common yeah. ownership or you could have a renewable energy project or something else. But I, I do think it goes back to the question in, in, in your comments of like, what is it you're trying to grow and how do you want to grow the world around you? Mm -hmm. And for the non profit sector, the thing I see time and time again is you want to grow this incredible world and yet you're not using the models that you need to, to, to make it happen. And so I think you can do the things you're talking about and what you're talking about, and, but you need, to, you need to look at all sides of the equation and the for-profit world really needs to look at the nonprofits to understand what are problems they can be solving through their activities and with the value set that that we've talked about, that you mentioned, and that you mentioned, and that, have, that has been brought up. See the, see, the thing, what I like about SACO is that it shields these small scale producers from banks. Yeah. You know, if you take your title and you take it to the bank, the moment you default even for a month, the loan will be recalled, and then you are in trouble. But a, a lot of people, particularly the lower class, the middle class, and so on, have managed to raise a lot of capital through circles with less risk of their security mm -hmm. being seized by the circle. The circle rarely does that. The circle kind of shields the individual members from the Shylock behavior of banks. You remember Shylock in Shakespeare? Shakespeare. Yeah. <laughs> a pound of flesh. That's how the banks are, really. And, 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 and people, originally people have feared getting titles because they feared that if you have a title, you have a, you have a temptation to take it to a bank and then you lose your land. Uh, of course, now with the coming up of circles and a lot of, I think, changes in law that protects people, uh, it's, 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 it's the small scale producer is a, is a small piece of land if they're members of circles, then they can't get money without necessarily risking losing their titles to banks. And, and all of this, there's, I mean, keep in mind there's multi, so this is one way to do it looking at the abundance cycle for your enterprise. But this without good policy behind it exactly. or looking at alternative ways, like the, the tactics are up there. I mean, one of the reasons they're up there is this is ways people are figuring out to remake the system, yeah. right? And so. But you need the policy behind it. You need to be looking at like communal ownership. You need to be looking at these things. And something that's appropriate in Brazil isn't going to work in Bar Harbor, Maine, no. or on Samso, or vice versa. And so I don't. And again, just with this idea of abundance, it's not the one solution. It's how do I pick and choose from all these different things at the right time in the right place to put them together. And I think, you know, and that's that's where the magic comes in. Right? And that's where you really have to understand what's going on around you and how do you draw on the cultural tradition? And how do you know when it's a good time to give people title? Or to look at banks or other non-traditional financing mechanisms? Or when do you have to break cultural barriers that are in place in order to have things grow in a new way? 
Yeah, Jim. But I wonder, is there, what is the role for governmental regulation and transnational UN re regulation? What I think I heard Rodrigo saying, or raising the issue, and it's what was going through my mind as well. I mean, you could, you could have a lot of great organizations doing great things, um, many of them maybe on small scale, it can be completely destroyed by a couple of humongous, humongously large transnational organizations with, you know, a real bottom line focus and just doing incredible destruction on a massive scale that that you feel sort of powerless, you know, you know, as, as a small organization. So where. You know, where's the control for? Well, if you actually look at what's been going on, like take the organic food industry, for example, you know, that was invented despite, you know, the uh, roughly $700 billion a year spent by large, you know, corporations. Um, and that grew up as a small movement and has, is growing at double digit rates. And it's the only place where there is any growth in, in food, at least in the U.S. context. So every time, and, and the other piece of this is, so every time there's a large corporation doing something like that, it opens up new opportunities elsewhere. Um, and then the, the other piece of this is that companies are starting to figure out that um, you will be more profitable, have a better, higher returns if you are starting to consider all of these stakeholders. You talked about mining, um, and if you talk to the, some mining companies, now they realize like, wow, we aren't even going to have permission to operate because of our history and what we've done. And so trying to, they're trying to remake uh, the way they're entering in communities, how they're working with people. Because in, in the future, you won't even have a license to operate if you're doing this. If you look at companies like Whole Foods Market in the United States, which is uh, the largest natural and organic retailer, they're the most profitable retailer in the United States versus everybody, including Walmart. So people are finding new ways of creating value that are more inclusive and create a greater competitive advantage. Um, I think on the policy side, in the US context, and if you've been following what's been happening with the climate change negotiations for the, the cops for the last 20 years, I mean, it's, it's pretty dead. I mean, it's so gridlocked that nothing is getting done. And so for me, you know, business is an, an enormous lever. It is the most ubiquitous activity on the planet. Um, and so the question, and so for me, I got interested in this because I saw this as a way to affect change. Um, and are there other things to consider? Yes, absolutely. But it, it, the question is, where is that lever going to go? Because right now it's tilting us, you know, sort of over the edge. And so if you can pull on that lever in new ways and have different uh, orientation, um, you know, that is how I see change coming about. And it's fast. Even the activists I know who were down at the last COP negotiations. They said, you know what, this is, this is idiotic that we get together. The only thing that's happening here is actually that businesses are, are, are starting to, to make changes because they understand that they can make a profit in it. And I totally hear your concerns, because, and I'm with you on them, because um, it's, it's not only about a profit motive, because there's values in there and a lot of other pieces. But I think the change, that, fortunately or unfortunately, that's a fast mechanism of change. But, Jay, uh, I hear you. No, I, I, I see climate change as a reality. We can't get away from it. Yeah. Because the rain patterns have changed. I mean, the assumption we used to make that in the, March, the month of March you go to plant and then you expect the rains to come, then you'll harvest by the month of June or something, no longer works in, yeah. in, in certain parts of Kenya, for example. The whole weather pattern looks completely messed up, which means that farmers cannot rely on extensive agriculture and using the kind of tools and seeds and so on they used to use, it doesn't just work. So somehow there must be a transition from large-scale, extensive uh, peasant agriculture to intensive agriculture by the peasants, which does not depend on the natural weather for production. And that means that some technology must come in, some capital must come in, and the size of production must be more intensive uh, with much more concentrated, concentrated labor, but f enough food should be produced, not just for consumption and for marketing. So all these uh, GMOs make sense, but on the other hand, uh, they may not very, be very good for the people, but the reality that there should be intensive agriculture is there. 
the fact that the intervention of green housing is necessary is there. The, the thing is that what is going to be public policy about this and what is the extent of state intervention uh, to help shield the producer uh, from sinking too much money on the infrastructure, as it were, uh, so that they can afford to get uh, some profit from what they do. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I, the, 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 the issue doesn't seem to be solved that easily by African governments either at this point in time. I'll give you another example. The sugar industry, like the cotton industry, for a long time has been run by state corporations or multinational corporations in Africa. And in Kenya, for example, the small-scale <laughs> farmer, whether it's a contract farmer for the, for the state corporation sugar industry or for a multinational, is, has been uh, exploited for a long time because what he gets from, his, from the value of his work is quite negative, I would say. And he's not really in control of the price at which the goods, the agricultural commodities are sold. So for years and years, the small-scale farmer has been working for the factory of the state as a proletariat, working at home, really. And now time has come that that relationship needs to be changed because even if the client may change, the productivity are going even much lower. So the whole structure of agriculture needs to be changed, but you can't abolish the small-scale farmer because that is the source of his or her livelihood. So there must be an intervention of the state at one level helping to uh, to inject capital and some, and some resources for infrastructure for the small-scale farmer. And there must be a market that gives the small-scale farmer a good enough price for the produce. Now, I don't think the way I see it from the point of view of our experience in, in Kenya so far, uh, that a model has been found to the satisfaction of the small-scale farmer. So I don't know how you will help us in this regard. <laughs> That's a tall order for the end of the night. <laughs> but I do, I do think, you know, people working at coming up with new models to aid in production or to convert um, and, or, or to find, find those new areas of value. Like just two examples really quickly. Um, in the United States, half of everything that is grown is thrown out. And it's probably, and uh, throughout the rest of the world, it's not that much different. The amount of, so there you have, if you can reduce your waste, you could be growing half as much food, right? So there's one. Number two is agriculture is the largest user of water and is incredibly inefficient in the way water is distributed. Um, and in some places, um, and especially in, you know, some of the northern parts of Kenya where it's a little drier, um, you know, and looking at different ways to have water distributed so you can irrigate with drip irrigation and other things, again, would be a much more efficient process. Um, and, but there's uh, lots of other ideas out there, I'm sure. And, and one of them you know, could be around having good policy to help you do those things. But I see Joe standing at the podium. Oh, you're good. Oh. <laughs> All right. Um, go, go ahead, Rodrigo. I think at least the figures of FAO, mm -hmm. the food organization, they say 70% of the food mm -hmm. People eat every day comes from small farmers, mm -hmm. family farming. Uh, there's a challenge for food so security and food sovereignty because mm -hmm. these are two important things. Yeah. We need to to have sufficient food in, with quality, but also we have we need to be owners of the food. Mm -hmm. When you see the seed market, mm -hmm. oh. we, we think they're seed, but, yeah. but they're food, even yeah. if they're poison. Yeah. But anyway, this is one issue. The other issue is how long we'll be in adapting to the changes, mm -hmm. artificializing more, and when are you going to sit down and discuss what's causing this? The, the, the World, World Business Council made a, what they called Agenda 2050 right. and created new markets. 
you know, I, I think you don't know, know this document. There's a 90 big uh, 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 corporations in right. the world, and yeah. in each country they have adapted because they have subsidiaries, right. uh, and and it's all facing. How can we adapt uh, to this new situation, and how can we keep doing, you know, our 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 business? In, and and uh, trying to, but I think if we don't discuss, if those, my, my question is, if those who are producing this are just adapting and asking people to adapt, many countries, they have a, they, they are lowering, lowering in, in food production, in agriculture, but because of what? Because of, I mean, of, uh, of external market. Of course, now with the economic crisis and they start to invest in food and then the prices went up. And then you broke people in Africa, you broke people in, 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 in Latin America. So there's a huge uh, 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 situation that we need to face. Otherwise, we'll be plastifying everything, mm -hmm. and we're gonna, ba ba uh, gonna buy this plastic from whom? From where? Our seeds. And, we, and then when we, when we talk about, not, well, I'm not gonna talk about Africa because I'm not from there, but artificialize uh, uh, the environment mm -hmm. in Brazil. When we have sun all over the year for the agriculture, you know, and, and, and rain, and then I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do artificial rain, and, and then, which is the cost? Mm. And, and then I, if you I wanna, okay. Yeah, mm. and then if it, <laughs> and, 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 and the other issue is, what happened with those who are, do, who are doing, uh, that's what I'm, I, I wanna stress. Because mm -hmm. normally the point of view is, we are living in this situation, and then we need to face this. Okay, I, I agree. But if we don't discuss the causes, the mm -hmm. roots mm -hmm. of why we are in this situation, mm -hmm. we're gonna have more people depending on these new products. So, Jay, <laughs> go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, so. Uh, I wish I should, there's a whole longer presentation that it goes into some of this, but the short answer to this is, um, I agree with you that those companies that are trying to do the same things, um, actually, uh, what my feeling is those companies are gonna go out of business. The companies that are doing this, what I was talking about and doing abundance, are gonna outcompete those companies and drive them out of business because they are trying to do it the same old way mm -hmm. with the same sources of value. And if you look at the history of, of just something like, let's take the Dow Jones Industrial Average, so the largest, most widely held stocks in the United States, and you look at the evolution of these companies that people were said, too big to go out of business, never will fail, U.S. Steel, Union Carbide, GM, yeah. um, creative destruction is alive and well in the economy, and my feeling is that those companies, the ones that you're talking about, are gonna be driven out because they're gonna be outcompeted by people who have a broader, more holistic uh, perspective that includes all of these things. And companies who hold the same value set that you hold are the ones that are gonna outcompete the others. Because this is a more complex model, harder to mimic, harder to imitate, and it helps you find all these new sources of value out of the problems that you see around you. So, so I agree with you that those companies aren't gonna last because they're gonna be comp out competed by others who are doing what I'm talking about. So. Thank you.